Welcome to the second harvest of Silicon Valley's virtual food safety training in partnership with Feeding America and Surf Safe Guidelines for Food Banking. We recommend you to share this training and training information out with any volunteers or staff that handle food or that help out with any part of your food distribution. This training will fulfill your annual food safety requirements for second harvest. And thank you all again for making food safety a top priority. After taking this training, you will have learned your role in keeping food safe, good personal hygiene, receiving and storing food safely, evaluating and transporting food safely, and cleaning and sanitizing. So why is there always so much talk and focus on food safety? We are constantly seeing headlines like these on the news to remind us that the threat of getting sick is actually very real. From meat recalls to vegetables or packaged foods, all food can become vulnerable to hazards. When we think of outbreaks, we usually think of a large mass of people, but the CDC has defined a foodborne illness outbreak when two or more people get the same illness after ingesting the same contaminated food or drink. Who's at risk? One in six Americans get sick each year by consuming contaminated food or beverages. About half of the victims of food poisoning each year are either children under 15 years old or seniors. Most often, a person experiences mild to moderate symptoms for a few days, then starts to feel better. However, Food poisoning can seriously affect the most vulnerable, such as our clients. Think of the community members we serve. Some are a highly susceptible population over the age of 65 with a weakened immune system or even those with diabetes. All of these factors puts our community members at a greater risk. Food poisoning can be more dangerous to your health than you may think. That's why it's so important to learn how we can all do our part. Now let's take a look at how we all need to do our part in keeping our food safe during the supply chain. When you come and pick up your food order or have it delivered, you trust that our staff has carried out the best food safety practices during the entire process. And when you are distributing food out to your community and your neighbors, they also trust you, your agency and your site that you have handled food in the safest manner, whether it's an outdoor food distribution at a school parking lot or inside a senior center, regardless of the environment, food must always be handled with care and utmost safety. We all have to do our part. In this section, we will discuss how food becomes unsafe. Let's learn and understand the different factors and practices that can make food unsafe. Environmental hazards. Here are the top three hazards from the environment, biological, chemical, and physical. For biological hazard, these are tiny forms of life that you may or may not be able to see, smell, or taste. These include bacteria, viruses, parasites, or fungi. Some of these can cause illness. That's called pathogens. For chemical hazards, know that all chemicals can contaminate food. This could include cleaners, sanitizers, and pesticides. Be sure to have any of these items clearly labeled and away from any food source. Physical hazards, think of what you may find on food that you probably don't want as part of your meal. This can include jewelry, broken glass, bugs, or even bandages. It can also come from a food source, such as bones or eggshells. Any of these hazards can contaminate food and cause illness. Foodborne illnesses are almost always preventable. Following good food safety guidelines and knowing how one can contaminate food is key to preventing any outbreaks. Here are the top unsafe food practices. First, poor personal hygiene. This is any time you're transferring pathogens from your body to food. This can be from being sick, coughing or sneezing on food. It can also be due to poor hand washing. The number one cause of foodborne outbreaks is due to poor hand washing. With cross-contamination, you are transferring pathogens from one surface or food to another. An obvious example is when you're in the kitchen using cutting boards. Cross-contamination can happen if you're using the same cutting board for raw meats and then using it for fresh produce without properly washing. However, in a food distribution setting, cross-contamination may not look so obvious. We will get back to that later on in the training. Time and temperature abuse. 
This happens when you let food stay out too long at temperatures that are ideal for pathogen growth. We recommend that food is kept out at room temperature for no more than two hours. We also understand that as the need of our community grows, so does the length of our food distributions. If you're finding that you need to keep your food out longer than two hours, we can help by providing thermal blankets to help control the temperature, keep food cold, and keep food safe. With cleaning and sanitizing, it's important that all surfaces that come in contact with food get properly cleaned and sanitized. This is not limited to just kitchen areas. Think of tables that you may use, bags or boxes that you pack food in, even share shopping carts to help clients carry their food. So as you can see, you can help prevent illness by always following safe food practices. Understanding food allergies. We know that about 15 million Americans have a food allergy. The proteins that cause a reaction are called allergens. Here are the top nine food allergens. Milk, eggs, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts, soybeans, fish, shellfish, and newly added to this list, sesame. Even the tiniest speck of food can make someone sick. This flyer here shares prevention methods along with common symptoms to look out for. This handout is available to you upon request and can also be found on our Nutrition Center website under the Food Safety tab. We also want to prevent cross-contact. Cross-contact happens when food containing an allergen comes in contact with another food. This can be very dangerous for someone with a food allergy. You can prevent cross-contact by following these guidelines. Clean and sanitize surfaces that have contact with a food allergen. Inspect food packages for leaks or spills that can cause cross-contact. And always wash hands and change gloves after touching an allergen food item. In this section, we will discuss good personal hygiene, understand when and how to wash your hands, using gloves, and other important food safety practices. The number one cause of foodborne outbreaks is due to poor hand washing. Washing your hands the right way is the best way to prevent food from becoming contaminated. Here is the right way to wash your hands. Number one, wet your hands under warm, clean running water and apply soap. Second, lather hands with soap. Lather the back of your hands between your fingers and under your nails. Next, you're gonna scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. Next, you're gonna rinse your hands under clean running water. And finally, dry your hands using a clean paper towel. You can also use hand sanitizer when soap and water are not available at your site. You wanna make sure that the hand sanitizer contains at least 60% alcohol and you're gonna wait for the sanitizer to dry completely before handling food, equipment, or putting on gloves. It's important to wash your hands before and after every switching task to prevent the spread of foodborne illnesses and diseases. You should wash your hands before, during, and after handling or preparing food items, especially food with a known allergen after handling all raw meat items, fresh or frozen, and after using the bathroom and handling the garbage. Here are some more important practices when working in or around the food handling areas. We ask that you remove jewelry. Jewelry can be a physical hazard if found in food, and rings and bracelets can also harbor harmful bacteria. We ask that you remove them when in the kitchen or working in or around food handling areas. We also ask that you wash hands before putting on new gloves and don't eat or drink in food handling or food storage areas. You'll wanna report your illnesses if you're sick or if you've been diagnosed with a foodborne illness. Here are some common symptoms of a foodborne illness. Vomiting, diarrhea, stomach pain, nausea, fever, or jaundice, which is yellowing of the skin or eyes. There are many viral infections out there that are highly contagious and spread easily, so we ask that you please stay home if showing any symptoms. The importance of wearing gloves. Gloves are single use only. You should change your gloves after every switching task when food is involved, such as bagging chicken, then switching to handling produce items. If your gloves are ripped or torn, 
if you've worn the same pair of gloves for more than four hours while handling food. Please note it is not necessary to wear gloves if you are not handling food, even if you're at a food distribution setting. This can be as you help with registration, guide traffic, or any other role that does not involve food. We also ask that you use your best discretion when handling dry goods, as gloves may not always be needed. We want to make sure that you do not blow into your gloves or roll them as you're putting them on. And do not reuse your old gloves, as again, they are single use only. Here are the compliance standards for our partner agencies. Feel free to pause the video at this time to read the safety and sanitation standards that we look out for. Please ensure that your hand washing stations are equipped with hot and cold running water, hand soap, single use paper towel or air dryer. You'll also wanna make sure that your hand washing station is easily accessible for your staff and volunteers and not used for storage. In this section, we will discuss receiving and storing food safely, learn about controlling time and temperature, inspecting food during receiving, and storing food safely. Bacteria can double in as little as 20 minutes when left in ideal conditions. These factors below all contribute to bacterial growth. The right food, time, temperature, such as the danger zone, pH level, oxygen, and moisture. Controlling time and temperature. Pathogens grow rapidly between the range of 41 degrees Fahrenheit and 135 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature range is referred to as the danger zone. This is the temperature that supports bacteria growth. You'll notice that if food is not in the refrigerator or the freezer or in the cooking process, it's most likely sitting in the danger zone. But remember that time also plays a big factor in bacteria growth, not just temperature alone. In the next slides, we'll share best practices in order to keep your food safe and at an ideal temperature. Here are time and temperature guidelines. Store or distribute food immediately after delivery or pickup. Record food temperature at delivery or pickup if possible. Distribute food within two hours when possible and keep dairy and all other perishable items covered by a thermal blanket during distribution if needed. These simple guidelines will help control the cold chain. The cold chain refers to managing and maintaining safe food temperatures during the entire process. The cold chain can be easily broken if the temperature is not controlled during the supply chain. Some examples of when the cold chain can be broken are when picking up food from one of our warehouses or grocery rescue retailers, long food distribution times, or long driving times in an unrefrigerated vehicle. If you have a thermometer on hand, it's good practice to check food temperatures as needed throughout the food distribution to ensure proper food temperature. This infrared thermometer shown here measures surface temperature. It displays the reading instantly and there is no risk of cross-contamination when measuring different foods because it doesn't directly touch the food item. You can pause the training now to read the recommended guidelines and refer to your thermometer instructions for proper use. Inspecting food during receiving. It's important to be those extra set of eyes to inspect a delivery and be sure to reject any food that has not been received at the proper temperature and also food that has not been properly labeled. In this chart, you can see the types of food and the temperature at which it should be received. Best practices for food placement during your distribution. Produce cases or unboxed items should be placed on a pallet, table, tarp, or clean cardboard. Do not reuse any poultry, meat, or egg boxes. Boxed items, such as milk crates, pre-boxed produce, can temporarily be placed on the ground during the distribution. In summary, Boxes with large holes at the bottom shouldn't be placed on the ground in order to keep the produce on the bottom from being contaminated. This can be broccoli or celery cases that tend to have big openings at the bottom of their boxes. Best practice would be to find a clean cardboard or tarp to set boxes on. And remember, never reuse chicken boxes as they can spread pathogens to any source that has come in contact with them. 
The first in, first out method is a system for storing and rotating the food in your refrigerator or pantry. Organize your food based on when you received it, but also note the dates on the food items. When checking food date labels, you'll want to store food with a sooner date in front of the items with a later date. Be sure to refer to our handout called, When Should I Eat This?, to help prevent food waste and to understand the meaning of food date labels. Here are some food storage guidelines for dry goods. Store food at least four to six inches off the floor and at least two inches away from walls. Place your shelving units away from the walls. Keep storage areas clean and use the first in first out method. Here are some food storage guidelines for refrigerated foods. Store ready to eat foods on the top shelf and above any raw meats, seafood, and poultry. Do not store these items on the same shelf. Label all foods clearly. Ensure refrigerator temperatures is held at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or below. And be sure to use the first in first out method, placing older food items towards the front and newer food items towards the back. A recall is when a food producer removes a product from the field or marketplace as there is reason to believe it may cause consumers to become ill. This can be from a contaminated source or also when a food allergen has not been properly identified on the label. We take food recalls very seriously here at Second Harvest. You will get notified by email with recall information on how to follow the proper procedures if we believe we have recalled food in our inventory or if recalled food has been distributed. In this section, we will discuss food date labels, known to many as expiration dates. Learn the meaning behind each food date label and how most foods are still safe to consume past these dates. Did you know that 90% of us have thrown some food out too soon and over half of us throw away food too soon on a regular basis? Here's a statement from Feeding America around dates on food. Food generally have dates on them that are based on quality. Accepting these foods after these dates is still acceptable as the foods are still safe to eat. This is telling us that these dates are not necessarily safety dates, but rather more freshness and quality dates. However, we know that food can go bad well before the date, especially if not stored properly. If you are unsure about a food item that looks or smells odd, it's best to just toss it out and not distribute out to the community. What does it mean when we see best by or best if used by date? This date indicates when the food item will be at peak quality and have optimal flavor. It is not a safety or purchase by date. After this date, the food is still safe to eat, but the quality and freshness begins to lessen. You can find this date in food items such as crackers, cookies, cold cereals, and dry shelf-stable food. Here we have use by or expiration dates. What it means, the last date recommended for the use of the product while at peak quality. A use by date is not a safety date, except for baby formula, baby food, nutritional supplements and drinks. Baby food and nutritional items should be discarded when past the date and never distributed. You can find use by and expiration dates on food items such as bacon, lunch meat, baby formula, and nutritional supplements. What does the sell by date mean? This date informs stores how long to display the food item before pulling it from the shelves. This is not a safety date. Stores often donate these food items as they are still safe to eat. You can find the sell by date on food items such as breads, milk, yogurt, cheeses, eggs, lunch meat, and packaged salad mixes. What does the freeze by date mean? This date indicates when a food item should be frozen to maintain peak quality if not being consumed soon. Food can still lose its quality or texture in the freezer over time, but still safe to eat. Always remember to follow proper steps to safely defrost meats to prevent any foodborne illnesses. You can find more tips on the proper ways to defrost on our poultry safety handout. 
In this section, we will discuss evaluating and transporting food safely, evaluating the conditions of food, inspecting your delivery, and distributing food safely. We are fortunate to be in an area where we can get an abundance and variety of produce from local farmers and from the California Association of Food Banks at a fraction of the price. A majority of the produce we receive is number two quality, not retail grade, may have some cosmetic defects, and you might find some unusual shapes and sizes. This produce, odd shapes and all, are still packed with nutrients and are safe to consume. For the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about produce quality and what to look out for. Many food items, such as produce, may require a closer look to see if they're safe to distribute. Never assume that the product is safe without inspecting it. A lot can happen from the time produce gets received into our warehouse to the time it gets to your hands and ready to distribute. We can have pallets of produce that look perfectly fine, only to find out that the bottom produce of the pallet has gone bad. It may be perfectly ripe when sorted into our boxes, but may have gone bad by the time it's ready to distribute. This is why it is so important to have volunteers help look through the order to ensure our clients are receiving the best quality we can give them. On the next slides, you'll learn when to sort through produce. And just for more content, when we say bad produce, we're referring to produce that is spoiled, has visible mold, bad unusual odor, and has cuts and slits. And if you're not sure, please take a picture and contact us. What is the proposed quality standard? We have a 25% rule to help. If 25% or less of the produce is bad, you are expected to sort through the produce and not distribute any bad quality produce. You must look through most cases to determine the percentage. Now you can still report back to the food bank when product falls under 25% and our staff can still report it on the issue tracker. If more than 25% is bad, sites can make the determination to either sort or reject produce. We encourage you to sort produce when possible. You must look through most cases to determine percentage and take pictures. You should also report back to the food bank regarding the quality and staff must report it onto the issue tracker. We want to encourage you to inspect most produce before deciding to send it back. Any produce with cuts and slits should be discarded as well. It's important to inspect for freshness, mold, and spoilage. And remember, when in doubt, toss it out. Please note a recent change regarding best practices when handling strawberries. When finding three or more moldy strawberries in a plastic container, we ask that you throw out the whole container. If there is two or less moldy strawberries, you'll want to discard the moldy strawberries along with any strawberries that are directly touching the moldy ones. Please have volunteers change their gloves if switching tasks and also be sure to communicate with clients to keep them aware of any food safety or quality issues. When inspecting a delivery, you'll want to check the overall condition of the vehicle. Driver vehicle must be clean, free of pets and animals, or anything else that might compromise food safety, such as unsafe food temperatures and incorrect storage. You should never place raw meats over any other food items, especially produce or ready-to-eat foods. Here are some guidelines to follow when loading and transporting food. This includes when driving your personal car or company vehicle. Food boxes are inspected for quality, for unrefrigerated vehicles, driving time is kept to under 30 minutes. Thermal blankets are used to maintain safe temperatures. Raw poultry and meats should always be placed at the bottom of the food order. And when making multiple deliveries, unattended vehicles are locked in between deliveries. You'll want to make sure the vehicle is kept clean, with adequate equipment, and food is correctly placed to prevent any cross-contamination. For more tips and best practices, be sure to reference our food safety checklist for home deliveries. Evaluating dry goods and cans. Discard cans and lids that are dented, swollen, or rusted. Deep dents in the body or seam of a can could be harmful, allowing air and bacteria to slowly enter. A swollen can shows that it has produced toxic gases, which causes it to swell and bulge up. For rust on cans, if you cannot wipe the light rust off with a damp paper towel, 
it must get thrown out. Rust slowly eats through the can, making it weaker where it can allow bacteria and air to enter. Be sure to also discard any dry good packages that have signs of pests, such as gnaw marks, droppings, insects, or pin size holes in packaging. Signs of pests in or around food can cause a serious foodborne illness. If you happen to find any items like these above, please be sure to look through your whole inventory and never distribute. If you think you received food in this condition from any of our warehouses, please be sure to take a picture of the food item and notify one of our program managers as soon as possible. Let's summarize some best practices and on-site safety procedures when distributing food out to the community. Distribution time is limited to two hours to best control food temperature when possible. Gloves are used properly when handling food. Volunteers inspect food for quality and safety. Meat and poultry are bagged separate and kept away from other food items. And thermal blankets are used when needed to control temperature. Raw meats, such as poultry, needs to be handled with extra care since this type of food supports bacteria growth and has the potential of contaminating other foods when not handled properly. Here are some guidelines to keep everyone safe during a food distribution. Volunteers wash their hands for 20 seconds or apply hand sanitizer before putting on gloves. Poultry is bagged and placed on top of a table, tarp, or cardboard at the beginning of the distribution line. Thermal blankets are used to regulate temperature of frozen poultry when needed. Volunteers distributing poultry or meat items stay at their station to prevent cross-contamination. Gloves are changed out before switching to different tasks. And boxes containing poultry, along with eggs and milk, are discarded and never reused. Do not place bagged poultry back in the original boxes as this could lead to cross-contamination. In this section, we will discuss cleaning and sanitizing, how and when to clean and sanitize, handling residuals, and managing pests. It's important to maintain a clean and sanitized area in order to prevent pathogens or other contaminants that can compromise the safety of your food. This will also help control pests, such as insects or rodents. Here is a difference between cleaning and sanitizing. Cleaning physically removes food and dirt from the surface or an object. Sanitizing is the process of both cleaning and disinfecting a surface or an object. When something is sanitized, the pathogens and germs on the surface have been reduced to levels considered safe. All food contact surfaces should be cleaned and sanitized. Before and after every use, when changing to a new food item, especially after working with raw meats, poultry, or an allergen containing item, and after four hours of constant use. You can clean and sanitize tables, tarps, and countertops, cooking utensils, dishes, and cutting boards, and refrigerators. You'll also want to sanitize all frequently touched surfaces, such as doorknobs and bathroom fixtures. Here are the steps to properly sanitize a food area, such as dirty dishes, countertop appliances, or distribution tables. You'll want to scrape or remove any food from the surface. Wash the surface, rinse, sanitize, and then allow the surface to air dry before using. We've highlighted a DIY solution for food contact surfaces. You'll want to mix one tablespoon of unscented bleach with one gallon of warm or cool water. Allow the solution to stand for at least two minutes before you wipe down, or you can have the solution air dry. You'll want to make a fresh batch every 24 hours and keep in a closed and labeled container or spray bottle. Handling residuals and cleaning up. Residuals and waste. Discard spoiled produce on site when possible. If not, place spoiled items in a residual bin. Place residual bins away from food distribution to prevent contamination. And do not let clients pick out food from the residual bins. With cleaning up, you want to wipe and sanitize tables and tarps that have been in contact with food, and you want to sweep the area to prevent pests. Also, when handling garbage, remove garbage as quickly as possible and be sure to keep garbage containers covered when not in use. Be proactive when spotting the first signs of pests, big or small. 
Following some simple guidelines from this training will help prevent pests and keep you, your food, and your community safe. Pests are a major food safety risk. They can transfer pathogens onto food and make people sick. Insect parts and rodent droppings are a source of physical and biological hazards. You'll want to know the signs, droppings, gnaw marks, or damage on food, and nests. You'll want to discard any food items if pests are spotted and notify your program manager or coordinator as soon as possible. All of the nutrition and food safety resources that we've covered here in this training are available on our website at our nutrition center at shfb.org forward slash nutrition dash center. You can also scan the QR code here to take you straight to our nutrition center. On our nutrition center, you'll find tasty and easy to follow recipes and cooking videos, nutrition tips, handouts, and online presentations, and information on food safety and food date labels. Our nutrition team is here to provide you with easy to follow handouts for you, your volunteers and staff, and your clients. Some of the available resources for you are recipe cards, nutrition handouts, food safety handouts, food safety checklists, and information on product recalls. Email us if you would like to coordinate copies to be sent to you. You can also visit our Nutrition Center or our Partner Resource page for ready-to-print PDFs. This concludes your annual Second Harvest of Silicon Valley's Food Safety Training. Be sure to take the short questionnaire that goes along with this training in order to complete the full training requirements. For those that complete the training, we will provide you with a certificate of completion upon request. We can also provide you with a free Surf Safe for Food Banking manual. Thank you again for making food safety a top priority, keeping our communities safe, healthy, and thriving.